Hey, I have three topics for today. Uh, maybe not three, like I have a slot tomorrow for the XXS, for the hash functions. But uh, one thing is uh, BPF static key or branch. So there are, BPF, uh, b there are static keys in the kernel and it would be cool to use them in VPF. Then uh, there is update on the wildcard map and what it is about and some use cases and some benchmarks. And tomorrow probably, because we don't have time, uh, I will follow on uh, how to use like a different, and doesn't make sense to use different hash functions for different VPF maps. So this is the, like, a set of VPF programs in empty psyllium cluster, so we want to have some functionality to trace what's happening with packets when they follow this path. And for kernel, we have the power review uh, program. It's a simple one. It just connects to uh, every uh, function in kernel, which utilizes the um, uh, SKB. As, as an argument, and then we can see like all events which happen with uh, packet through the kernel. But uh, we don't see with this tool what's happening inside the Silum path, because BPF can manual packets and drop them and redirect them. So in addition to tracing all the functions which uh, touch SKBs in kernel, we want to do the same in BPF, and uh, in the best case, we need to run the same tool, and it will attach to both places. So there are existing ways to implement this already. First one is to attach ftrace and fexit, but the problem here is that Silum utilizes tail calls, and all the errors here is uh, uh, tail calls in BPF, and uh, for tail call, we can't attach to a fan tree uh, because um, the tail call jumps over the prolog, and a fan tree is inside prolog. So instead, for tail calls, we need to place uh, some debug call right after the prolog. So we can do this uh, by eliminating tail calls from Silum, but as you've seen like this, there are a lot of them and the state machine is not so simple, so probably we won't be able to do this in the foreseeable future, but we will try. And uh, the, another solution is just if dev code and uh, reload program programs if we want to debug something. And this, of course, works, but uh, we really don't want to do this in prod uh, because it's uh, error prone and uh, program size can change and then they fail to load and stuff like this may happen. And in any case, it takes like seconds or tens of seconds to reload data path and recompile everything. So not, not a good solution. So the, another solution is just to use um, a domino inline function and to replace it. This is already, yeah, my question. Um, I thought tail call is actual, well, the tail call that you said skips to F entry, because usually the tail call is usually, you know, at the end of the function, it'll jump to another function, but then it should be jumping at the F entry of the other function. So uh, in BPF, we specifically jump over the function prolog if we well, do tail call. <clears throat> And the entry is the first instruction, like it's the instruction before the prolog, actually. So I'm trying to figure, oh, wait, so the BPF? Yeah, yeah, BPF trampoline, a entry, it's yeah. the first instruction of the program. Yep. And uh, it is right before the prolog. Like normally it's nope, then it goes prolog. Oh, so you're saying, that you mean the tail call from BPF itself? Or is it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay. The, 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 the BPF the kernel, tail call. Yeah. Okay, because in the kernel, the, the tail call would go into yeah, the... Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I was a little confused by that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we, we can just attach a dummy function which does nothing, and then we... Uh, when we do not enable debug, we just execute it, and it takes about, like, two nanoseconds for a function call, an empty function call, 
it's uh, not, not that bad, but uh, we have many tail calls per packet, and uh, in 99% of time, uh, we don't need this function at all, so it's like just an extra 10 nanoseconds per packet in data path, and this leads to uh, visible packet drop rate. So um, another solution is not actually a solution, it's just a hack I tried to when I was measuring things, just to jump to the F entry so the tail call do not bypass it. So we go through prolog and then restore the state. Uh, but basically it's the same as calling an empty function, because just an opposite way. Like when we call an empty function, we just do prolog then epilog. And here we do opposite, like prolog then like reverse epilogue. So another solution, which is uh, which is what we're looking into, is uh, reusing the static key infrastructure for BPF, and this uh, lets us to to run debug with zero overhead because we're just executing one knob instruction, which is actually like not scheduled even. So interface for this would be something like this: we, we have a program. And then we do BPF static branch uh, of some key. And uh, this key is, uh, for example, just, just an array map. We, we need to distinguish it somehow from normal array map. Here I just added like a f artificial flag, which don't exist. We can do this somehow else, but it's just, just a piece of memory. Um, and the BPF static branch is uh, uh, is utilizing the awesome go to functionality as well as like static keys inside kernel. So this compiles into go to uh, debug. So LES will be a BPF print car this inner hello and. Um, in the program, it looks like this. So we go to, to this label, we record this uh, in the program, like for example, of set one when we're using the static key. And uh, when we load this program, Verifier doesn't know if we jump or not. So it will uh, process the debug code here. So there will be no dead code. But when we load the program, we verify it and then replace this jump by knob. So the code uh, just runs as there is no debug case at all. Later, if we update the map with like non-zero value, we go to the program, we go to the like table of uh, static keys and patch the related static keys here with the label, and when we zero map, uh, we do opposite, so it again becomes like zero expense debug. And then I had to catch the flight, so I didn't go further. So the the question here is like how to pass the jump of sets when we load program and probably like put it into somewhere. Daniel proposed auxiliary, uh, like BTF, any, anything. But basically, like this is interface. So, are there any like? Is there somehow like an option? I mean, like this jump table. I mean, we do have it for tail calls when we do this direct jump versus no upright. That's in the kernel, but that's like that is populated during the verification process. So if the verifier sees that all the paths that, that lead to this tail call, that they have like a constant um, map key where we do then the lookup, and when this is guaranteed, then we will do this direct jump instead of indirect one. Um, is there like a way you could infer this jump offset from, um, you, know, you know, like from the verification itself, like if it would be like an like a like a con conditional jump, like a special conditional jump, and then you would be able to. Um, yeah, I mean, you can use some 
new instruction for this, right? But uh, it's basically the same as providing some offset to, see, to tell verifier, like, look, here is a jump which you need to patch. Like from... No? So you're saying you, you would basically put this... Yeah, so when, when, when you like load the program, you just put uh, this offset 1.1 into a table, and then a verifier goes there, look, looks where the jump is performed, and then replaces this by knob and stores like the, the both. So it might be easier if you try and do it as, uh, I think earlier, like, like uh, as a, as a uh, sorry, a global variable basically. Like w w when we had the talk earlier, like the red black tree and that red black tree had the, had like a, a global mutex that protects the red black tree, right? You could do something similar where you say the static key is a global variable. And yeah, yeah, but this is what it is right here. Like the static key is a global variable. So the way that you showed it is the static key is kind of a, a map and that works differently than a global variable that you define that is like yeah yeah but um, uh, when you when you change the value of this global variable you need to execute some uh, function right right so you're proposing to like add a set of k functions to like work with global variable or what okay sorry so the I mean uh, it's I, I it's not not a, <coughs> sorry to take not a, a big back. not a big difference like how you control this so so, sorry, I, I tried to, you're right. So I, I was trying to, I was thinking about how, how would you pass the jump table to the kernel? And I think the easiest answer would be treat it like global data and then use the existing infrastructure. And then in the kernel, you can look at basically the way it ends up working is you have So, so you mean like creating a map, populating it with like offsets and then referencing the... Or no, no, like when you, in, in BPF, you declare a variable at the top of your, above your function that says static key such and such and you reference that in your C code that ends up behind the scenes that ends up being like a special map and your loader libppf or the ebpf library or whatever is going to mm -hmm. take references to that and adjust the instruction and in ah, the kernel yeah, you can you figure mean, out you, this you mean just create a like global variable with some tag and then with based on type. this tag we create the, the underlying implementation right uh, exactly so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Re, re, uh, this works use, yeah that would be much easier because you don't have to come up with a new method. You would have to, yeah, there's a yeah. little bit it's of details. just like how it's some, yeah. yeah. And then the other thing is how, what I don't know and what I can't answer is like, how would you then toggle the thing on and off from user space? But you'd have to come up with a way of doing that, I guess, yeah. And maybe to go one step further, I did something similar for um, global data. So what I did, I don't know, maybe a half year back, I basically rewrote those um, dereferences into uh, static jumps in the BPF before loading. So do you really actually need kernel support for that? Because you can flip this on and off in the user space and atomically replace the program, reload it, and you kind of get the static function, um, static jumps without even kernel moment, right? You can replace this jump on uh, No. Uh, because we refer, we'll think this is that code, or just, yeah. I guess you'll have to go through verification again, right? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I can do this, like, with recompiling and if they But, yeah, I mean, so. like, the, at least if you don't want to do it in the user space, having a global variable seems a bit better than having a special map flag. Mm -hmm. You can have, like, underscore, underscore. This yeah, but uh, under the hood, it will be the special map, right? It's, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, from from user point of view, yeah, I will just declare we're able. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not very familiar with the BPF program layout, but does it have like sections at all? Do you, when you put when you send it in, does it does it have sections? Then why can't you just make do like what the kernel does and just make a section and tell and then make the verifier aware of this? Yeah, what, this that, works. That would probably be the easiest thing. So when it's loaded. The verifier, I mean, the section will just say, like, you have a jump label section. Mm -hmm. It's just like... Yeah, yeah, the, this this is what it's, like, basically... Yeah. So... Yeah. And then, I guess, so your question is, like, how did... And it, yeah, so you have that, and it has the section there, so the mm -hmm. kernel will then know, 
that's a jump label, right? And then you yeah, just do, do we have sections in BTF? Right? No, we just have like a set of types, right? But yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, data stack are in BTF. Oh, sorry, I apologize. They are in BTF, yeah. but you could also get libppf to bunch mm -hmm. it somehow or whatever. Yeah. And then just have to have some hook to tell the kernel enable these because I think you want the verifier and everyone to know about this because I don't think you want just depend on users. Yeah, of course. Like right. uh, verifier will know about this because like after verification it will do this. Yes. Uh, well, so, JIT will do this, but. So the question is, yeah. just have to tell something to turn it on, right? Mm -hmm. and then yeah, but um, yeah. So why why I use the map here is uh, because this like map some some map because it's really simple to control this like BPF update element and then it toggles the. So I I I missed the first like minute probably yeah. or two. Uh, what was the motivation to do this as a static key? Like because the overhead of like if because, because is overhead too high? is zero, like for for not executing how, it. How much is the overhead for like literally one if, especially if you can lay it out so that like branch prediction usually takes the the optimal path. Mm -hmm. uh, so one if will will involve like reading a map, right? So it's not ju just if it's. Like another no, no. With global data, you're literally just reading memory directly. It was like when you do global variable, right? Under cover, like you don't do map lookup. You just just know where to look. Mm -hmm. And you you do it for every packet, and you do it not yeah. like once for every packet because we we have like multiple tail calls, so it, think, it adds to several nanoseconds per packet. By the way, think of the uh, branch predictor as a cache. And you're using cache that you don't have to be using. And once you, you're right, the branch predictor will do it, and it'll be great. But then, but to, but it only it will only save so much. In fact, I just found out by analyzing the Chromebooks config that they had jump labels disabled. And when I enabled it, things sped up like uh, the several tests sped up like ten percent. So that's a huge hit. Uh, could you go back to uh, ASM in line part? So if I got you right, you're saying the verifier will only uh, verify the pass where it is uh, true, right? Or both? Will it verify no, both? I, th I think it's both. Like the lookup and deref static branch here, like it returns um, like or true or false. So verifier will do the both. So the verifier will, OK. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, okay. like, what I, I mean, what I still didn't quite get, like, with this jump table, like, why why this cannot be inferred from the instruction? Like, if this is, like, as I mentioned, like, when you have this if condition, this is not known at verification time, so the verifier will look at both. I mean, it has to look at both paths to make sure it's safe. And but you also know where, where to jump, right? Yeah, yeah. But how how do you distinguish it from normal jump? Like if it's just like the code, special jump instruction. Yeah, but it's like pro probably it's simpler just to add some info to BTF than to like create a new instruction for this. I mean, okay. And then it can be changed as well because like creating instruction is creating new API. Yeah, uh, well, it, this is, in any case, some UAP error, right? But <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a question, maybe. <laughs> Can you go back a couple slides? I, I, I've lost track of why you're doing this, to be honest. Hmm? I've, I've, lost, I've lost track of the point. Can you, can you go back <laughs> to, like, why? Okay, okay, we want to debug Silum. And you want to, you want to get a, a call trace of the tails calls? Yeah, yeah, so... When we look at packet, how it travels through the kernel, we can trace it inside kernel, yeah. but we can't trace it inside BPF the same way. So I, I wouldn't worry about performance. Why? Because you're not gonna, you're debugging a stack. You're gonna not, like, if you have this, for example, XDP cards running a 100 gigabit card, right? You're gonna turn this on, you're gonna, like, 
and do what? Throw every packet through your tracer? Like, I. <sighs> Right, so that's basically avoiding this. If I'm in the debug mode, do nothing. That's what you want to avoid. And, and I think what I'm saying is you have a production system with 100 gig NICs, with SLAs. As soon as you turn this on, you're going to like perhaps break all of those. Um, like I don't think even in the debug case, you should throw every packet into this mode. And then the, the other question I didn't quite understand, maybe just really quick, are you suggesting we add code to Cilium, be Cilium so that this debugger can work with Cilium, or are you trying to interpose on the tail call in the yeah, Exactly, it's uh, like adding code to Cilium, and I, no, I, no, no, it, it actually will help like Cilium developers I, I to work with the Cilium. It's, it I, is I, the, like, I, <laughs> the I, I've been thing. in this position many times, so I, I understand the, the value of that, but I would say, can we do this with out modifying the Cilium code, right? Because because if you need to modify the Cilium code, why don't you just write the debugger into Cilium directly? Like, why are you even using packet? Where are you at all? Just debug, put a filter inside there when you turn it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But exactly like putting filter inside Cilium, uh, we want to do this with zero overhead. Like we we can add it so, with like non-zero overhead or with a compilation stage. But we want to like add it to like every production Cilium instance, and do not spend time when it's not enabled. So the and, and the other thing is like if you I mean you've probably run packet where are you right? So it will basically attach to all the SKB and like you can go to net filter to all the layers and you see where the packet is going through the stack, and then you can also have the visibility for the BPF part itself that is in Cilium, because right now you would only see that from the QDisk layer, you would drop the packet and that's it, but you don't see exactly like how far it like went through it, like in, in, into which tail call and so on. So you don't have this visibility all at once, right? Like with the, so. I mean, the, the overhead of turning packet where are you on is like you're worried about this micro detail when no, just, no, no, no. just hooking uh, every K for Multiply it by like time. No, no. Because we, we want it, we want to enable it only for like short period no. of time. I, you're gonna turn this on, and you're gonna hook every function in the kernel that has a SKB struct, right? Yes. The overhead of that is way worse than the calling a K probe from like SKB alloc, SKB build, like everything. The overhead of that is much greater than worrying about this tail call thing. Is all I'm saying, right? No, no, no but, but uh, yeah. I think Anton is saying, how do we do this so that the common case where we don't turn it on doesn't get slower? Yes, yes. Right. OK, I uh, want to ask a follow-up question. If if you could have F entry tracing for these things that was in yeah, the, if, in if the we, off case, it's cheap, would that solve it? If like, we have F entry tracing for tail calls, it will be like the more or less the same, but. Um, what is more or less the same, sorry? Hmm? What, what is more or less the same? The um, so to enable a fentris for tail calls, as I believe, it will require like a little bit more overhead than just calling an empty function or the same one. Okay. So, but the calling the empty function is something you do from Cilium, the BPF code base, or yeah, yeah. At the okay. beginning of tail call, you just call an empty function. Okay. F at the end of tail call, you can attach to F exit. Okay. At the beginning, you can't. And. Follow-up question, the, the reason we can't do F entry tracing right now is because the, the way that tail calls work is they jump to it kind of too late into the function, basically. Too late. For yeah, yeah, they, they over jump the prolog, so we don't push <coughs> the stack okay. once more. So maybe this is not a good idea, but what if we have a static key that said, actually jump into the F entry prolog, and you can toggle that on or off globally, I guess, and you could say, Enable F entry tracing of BPF tail calls, and then in the default case, that's. Okay, Alexi says what I'm describing already exists for certain specific cases, for, s for certain kinds of tail calls. So, why don't we do it for the other kinds of tail calls? More overhead, okay. 
And could we just say dynamically toggle that, or is that impossible? Um, th this thing is not only for tail calls, right? So we can enable specific pieces of code and programs as well in the in this form. Like, no, 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 in the middle of program. Like it's it's a static branch. You you can enable or disable pieces of code inside the program as well, and as many as you want. Example is when we're using some maps to filter things, but they're not always looked up because they can be empty. If you populate it, then you jump to this code. If you don't, then you just over jump it. I, I think you need to get that. Like also, what happens as soon as we take try to optimize Cilium and remove tail call, like it's gonna you're just gonna lose it again, right? So I think just like I think being concerned about tail calls is maybe not the point. Here you go. Sorry. Uh, I think, uh, to be honest, we're too bogged down in this uh, <coughs> arguing whether use case makes sense. I think, like aside from that, even use case doesn't. Static keys they exist in the kernel and they're useful, right? So sooner or later we have to add them to VPA programs. How we add them? That we should probably argue. But whether like use case this particular use case makes sense, pff, I'm not a serial developer. Yeah, as a Cilium developer, I was just going to say, I, I think static keys make sense in general. I don't know about the Peru use case. I don't know about tracing everything, but yeah. If you if you see a reason for static keys in general, then definitely like we should we should discuss that. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're on. Yeah, cool. All right. Okay, let's find another better use case and <laughs> implement this. <laughs> John says, well, what Alexei says. <laughs> okay, I'm out of time, but I will go in for another small presentation. So, an update on like wildcard map. So, it's wildcard map is a thing which lets us to filter different kinds of structures of rules. You can uh, just imagine that we want to create a map to filter four tuples or five tuples. Or we want to create a map to filter some set of identities. Or we want to filter port ranges or something like this, so multiple sets of ranges. And uh, there is a way to like represent this in a generic way. And even to implement this to more or less uh, good state. So. And the, um, the interface here is that uh, we, we create a map, we define some particular structure on this map, and then we just do BPF lookup element and BPF update. And um, here, an example, like we, we have um, a map which just checks one identity, which refers to a pod or a process or something like this, and then a port range. So the key here will have uh, some meta information, namely that it is the key, uh, it is the rule, and uh, its priority inside for lookups. And then uh, the identity and range minimum, range maximum. So this is used when we create rules inside map and delete rules and lookup rules. If we want to match input based on, on these maps, we create a key of different type uh, and just specify the identity and the port. Identity is matched against identity in the rule and port is matched again against uh, port minimum and port maximum. Um, and um, to, to, to make this map real generic, uh, there are several types of rules which can be inserted. One is prefix. You can think of like IP prefix, uh, IP seeder, address and prefix. Then uh, there is a range. We can create uh, either wildcat ranges or small ranges. And then uh, there is a match. And match can be of two types, like when we match exact or when zero inside the rule means wildcard match. And uh, we, we can combine uh, several uh, rules 
of these types to, to create like a combined rule for the map, and then we define a map. So as an example here, this ID and port range, we create map description, which says it has two rules. One is prefix. Uh, prefix? No, it should be much anyway. Uh, and another is port range. And then we just create a BPF map, uh, referencing this uh, policy key. And uh, initially, like when I first posted this, I added like a lot of fields to describe the map structure, but it turns out that I can combine everything inside just the map key description. So um, this magic macro creates this like big structure, and the union is to distinguish between rules and keys. It, like one one part has all the fields for rules and another for keys. And then there is this hack. So this is actually the biggest question of this uh, presentation. So this struct, struct policy description um, is uh, a, an object which describes the map. It's array of size zero, so it doesn't uh, affect the key size or anything, but it is place it inside the key BTF and this map, when it is created, the this description is verified and appropriate map structure is created. So, yeah, so uh, next I will uh, show some use cases and benchmarks, but the, the main question here is, is this, does this look okay to to create map based on key BTF structure? Uh, if Case Cook was in the room, he would say no. <laughs> uh, He's been doing enormous amount of work getting rid of the this GCC extension, and he is determined to get rid of it everywhere possible. Okay. Um, w what are it's even worse than this. This is GCC only. Clang doesn't never supported this. Like this, yep. What do you mean? I don't think you can compile it with Clang. I, I do. No, 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 I definitely compiled this with Clank. Yeah, C, C as a language, I think, allows like zero yeah, yeah, sized it's not, fields. It's not, so yeah. like the cleanup that Keys is doing is like when we use struct as like a kind of extensible struct, right? And we declare either like zero sized array at the very end as a last field. And he's converting that to like flexible with no zero. This is not because it's at the no, very No, no, it's zero size array. This is zero sized at the beginning, so it's not like a flex array struct at all. I think this should be fine with keys at least. Don't don't we also use this in the kernel, like in the skbuff even, like where we have like a marker with Yeah. I have a <clears throat> I have a bit more of a high level question. So um the wildcard map, does it uh enable some kind of functionality that you otherwise wouldn't have? Or does it make something that is kind of hard to implement easier to use, or maybe something else? Yeah, yeah. For, for us, uh, primary use case is to support port ranges in Kubernetes. There, there is no way like to to combine port range lookup with a hash lookup, like in, in one operation or like simple operation. So. OK, um, yeah, maybe we can chat after. I mean, there is. I've I, I've done that with a different algorithm, maybe not in a single operation, but it's it's pretty fast too. So you know a better algorithm to do this, or? Yeah, I gave like a really short thing at the, the eBPF summit. I'd kind of laid out the algorithm. It's called like a linear bit vector search. It's a linear algorithm, but it's it's very fast because it's cache efficient. Okay. My question is related. Is there some like uh, efficient implementation of this data structure? 
Yeah, let's look. <laughs> so one of the use cases is uh, Cilium network policy. And uh, currently we do s up to six hash lookups. So we, we take a rule and we break it into different patterns and we zero like wildcard parts of the key and do lookup by lookup until we find uh, a match. And we always have a wildcard match, like all, all field zeros in the end. And um, we, in particular, we have the port here. And Kubernetes now, by standard, needs to support port ranges, so it doesn't fit here. And with wildcard map, we, we do like ex exactly the same algorithm uh, under hood, but uh, it supports port ranges here. So for the productivity, it looks like this. So here, wildcard map. Uh, performs a little bit poorer than uh, hash implementation. It supports port ranges, but it be behaves a little bit poorer. I didn't, maybe it can be optimized by unrolling some things as well. Um, but this is the algorithm which is used. There is a different algorithm which I didn't try yet. It's tree based, so. Uh, but it, it just takes time to to switch things and to benchmark all this. So another, I don't have a benchmark for this. Like yeah, for like real benchmark, the JYP case, right? JYP, we, we have like a huge set of IP address prefixes which map to a country or a city or something like this. And here, um, this wildcard map, like. It uh, behaves just an just as an uh, LPM tree, and uh, to to match to the LPM tree, so LPM has prefix and address, and it finds the longest prefix. And for wildcard, uh, we do the same, like we, we put address and prefix, and we set the priority to the length of the prefix. So it's uh, the, the same UAPI as LPM, and for bigger uh, sets of keys, it actually behaves better. So here for like IPv4, it's about like four million entries. Um, it behaves like one lookup is about uh, 700 nanoseconds for LPM, which is implemented in like original LPM, it's like uh, 1,100, 102. And for IPv6, uh, it's also about like 40% faster. And for the for the random data, it looks like this. So wildcard implementation, like hash-based implementation of LPM, it works faster for and as key grows, it works faster. For IPv6, it also works faster, but not initially. So there, there is some overhead initially, and it just starts to, to work faster from about like one million IPv6 entries, which fits the JYP data case, but like in general case, uh, it, it is not as efficient. So the problem with this wildcard map is that you, you really need to understand the use case and how to use it, because it looks like it is not possible to do like really generic algorithm with be which beats all the uh, other like implementations. But it's still, yeah, if, if you misconfigure input, if you misconfigure, this is the same um, set of rules as here. But uh, here, this wildcard map can degrade a lot. And th there are ways to fix it. Uh, I didn't finish it because it breaks the like how the RCU works, how we update things, and um, work in progress. <laughs> yeah. So. So yeah, the, the, some resume is that uh, this wildcard map. Uh, I think the like UAPI looks okay, M minus this zero array thing. But uh, the actual implementation, I probably will work more on it because uh, it doesn't like it doesn't perform as well as I want. Like it's it outperforms in some specific cases, uh, but. 
it's not generic enough because like pe people can shoot their legs off with with it if misconfigure. I just want to confirm um, it is used in the kernel, the zero LA uh, as a marker in actually SOC com common. The SOC common uh, structure in the Linux kernel, the, the zero, zero length array, it has two, there's a, you know, what's it called? SKC, don't copy begin, SKC, don't copy end. I guess it's just used as markers within the structure to know what not to copy in the. Right. So, <laughs> so I just want to confirm that it does exist. I guess when when I was asking about the implementation, I was wondering if like it's some some very fancy tree and that will yeah, allow it's, you it's, to. It's it's the fancy algorithm from like tuple merge white paper. Okay. Uh, it's the last time I implemented white paper algorithm because it took like too long to actually toggle all the pieces and it's not yet finished. So, because the other part of the question would be like, can you just implement it in like pure BPF code, like you know, with loops and all that stuff? Because you can do a lot of work now with BPF. Right, and then like you won't have to like define it as part of your API and like all this complex macro like and sort of like mini language how you define the rules and all that stuff. It will be yeah, just like tuned to your use case. Uh, maybe this is the way to go, uh, if especially if we have some like hash function k funks helpers or something like this because in BPF well, it will be We definitely be plan to add hash function, and now we have din pointer, so it's like very easy to do. So yeah, in, in this case, it might be possible to 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 make like the most efficient for this for this particular case. It seems like a good first step, right? Like try to implement it with BPF and see what works, what doesn't, and then like see. Yeah, if I mean, for, for for this map particular, it like it is generic interface which works, so you can prototype things uh, in any case and get some more or less good productivity with it. But yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much.